look at two passages of scripture today to find out what God has to say about giving. Both passages are found in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. And Mark mentioned last Sunday that we're not going to be putting as many verses on the screens from now on. We actually want all of us to open our Bibles and turn to the passage and follow along in the Word of God. So please turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians is in the New Testament. You'll find the book toward the end of the Bible. Now, before stepping into this morning's passage, it's a good idea to pause and consider the context that prompted Paul to write these words. While the Apostle Paul loved and cared for all the churches in his day, he was especially concerned about the Christians who were living in the city of Jerusalem. Because they had placed their faith in Jesus Christ and were following Christ, they were driven into poverty. They were ostracized socially and economically. And they were driven even deeper into poverty when they, along with all the people in the city, suffered through nearly 15 years of severe droughts and famines. Paul was deeply concerned for them, and he knew that they needed financial help if they were going to survive. So he approached the Gentile churches and asked if they would contribute to a relief fund that could be given to these Christian brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. Now, Corinth, the church at Corinth, was one of the churches that volunteered to, to help. And although they were a prosperous church, they were a wealthy church, uh, almost a year had passed, and they still hadn't made good on that promise. They still hadn't fulfilled that promise they had made. So in the verses we're about to read, 
the Apostle Paul addresses the issue with them. Now, you might expect Paul's tone to be stern. You might expect him to be a little heavy-handed. But that's not Paul. That's not what Paul was all about. He actually has no interest in having the Corinthians feel guilty. Instead, what he wants them to understand is grace. And, And that's what's so beautiful about this passage. For Paul, the issue in giving isn't really money. In fact, he doesn't even use the term money in these two chapters that he writes to them about money. Never uses the word. For Paul, the issue in giving is grace. And how when we receive the incredible grace of God, how it leads to a joyful, cheerful, extravagant generosity in us. So to help the Corinthians understand this this grace of giving, as Paul's going to call it, Paul's going to speak to them about a group of Christians in a place called Macedonia. He'll bring them up as an example of what it looks like to be generous givers, to have this sense of joy in giving. So now we're ready. Let's read Paul's words as preserved for us in the Word of God. Beginning at verse 1 of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul writes, And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty, you through his poverty, might become rich. There's so much to learn from these verses, and I ask you to take out the outline in your worship folder, and we're going to dive right in and learn all we can in the brief time that we have. I absolutely love what Paul says at the end of verse 7, he calls us to excel in this grace of giving. And I think that's a beautiful phrase. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? The grace of giving. And you get right down to it. Giving isn't an obligation. It's not a a duty to Paul. Giving is a grace. It's, It's a blessing that God gives us. The ability to give is a grace that comes from God. I mentioned four things that I see in here where Paul is describing this grace of giving the first, he he tells us that giving is a privilege. Giving is a privilege. Uh, Preachers, I I can tell you, get nervous when they have to preach on subjects like money and giving. And I know the feeling. It's not my favorite thing to talk about. But I have to tell you, after looking at this passage, my, Paul's turned me around. I have a different, I'm not going to apologize for talking about giving. Because I realize that this is a joyful thing. And in fact, this giving that we're called to is actually a privilege for us. Speaking of the Macedonian churches, Paul says in verse 4, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. Uh, I've been a pastor for like 27 years. And I can tell you, in all that time, I've never had a single person come up to me and actually plead with me (laughs) to be able to give to the Lord or give to the Lord's work. But Paul says, these Macedonian believers, believers, they they urgently pleaded with him for this privilege of giving to these needy brothers and sisters. The word privilege is the Greek word for grace. So this is another aspect of grace. We have this this grace of giving, and, and they urgently pleaded to participate 
in this grace gift. Now, the great thing here is that giving is a privilege. There's no doubt, doubt about it. But you don't have to be financially privileged to give. Paul said the Macedonian churches were themselves experiencing the most severe trial and severe poverty. So this is, this is interesting, isn't it? You have this church, this Macedonian church, who, as Paul says, are going through the most severe trial, and they're going through severe poverty. But they plead with the apostle, can we please give money to our brothers and sisters in Jerusalem because they have it worse than we do. They have it worse than we do. Now, Paul didn't even want to bring the subject up with them. He thought, you know, there's no way I can ask these people to give when they're in the midst of this severe trial and severe poverty. He didn't even want to bring it up. So they had to insist. They had to insist. Paul was wrong. Even in poverty, we can give. In fact, it could be that the worst of times are actually the best of times to give. In verse 2, out of the most severe trial, Paul says, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Another thing we learn is, is that giving proves our love for God and for the family of God. And that may sound strange, but listen to what the apostle says in verse 8. He says, I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. Sounds odd. I mean, that, is that fair to put someone to a test like that? In the video, Scripture was quoted where the Lord says, test me in this. Give to me, test. Test me to see if I'm indeed faithful. So we're okay testing God, but isn't it right then for God to test us too? I mean, what speaks louder? Saying I love you with words? Or say, I love you with action. And here are the Macedonian believers. They're saying, we love these brothers and sisters we haven't even met. And here's a gift to prove that love. It's been said that giving is a visible sign of invisible grace. It's, it's a visible sign of invisible grace. When we give, we're showing proof. We're proving that we really do love God. And we really do love his people. Next, Paul shows us that giving involves our money and our lives. Our money and our lives. Speaking again of the Macedonians, he says in verse 5, And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. They gave themselves. Remember in old movies, like a robber or a bandit would come up to somebody, stick out a gun, say, Your money or your life? Well, with God... It's your money and your life. And not to rob us, but to bless us with this abundant life he talked about. Before the sermon, I prayed for Dave and Debbie Bliss. And as I said, I hope you take time to read this, this insert, this testimony. And normally when you ask a missionary for information, a missionary responds by giving you just that. They give you information. A very important, very uh, necessary information. Usually they tell us, about the status of their work. They may talk about how many people have been converted. They may send a list of needs. They'll talk about prayer requests, things like that. But we asked Dave Bliss for some information, and this is what he sends us. And I, I know you haven't read it yet, but you're going to find it. He didn't give us what you normally expect. He didn't give us data. He didn't give us information. As important as that stuff is, what Dave Bliss gave us was himself. He gave us a part of his story. He opened up about who he is. He's, he's, he's real to us in this testimony. He shared what he described as 10 years of trial, a decade of pain and struggle with one of his very own daughters. Dave Bliss has given himself to us. We talk about giving to God. We talk about giving to God a portion of our money. And that's good to do, and that's a part of what it means to follow Christ, but we act as if it's ours, like we're giving back a you know, portion of our money to him. It's all his. God owns everything. I was thinking the only thing he doesn't own, the only thing he really wants that he doesn't have, is the human heart. And he can't have it unless we give it to him, unless we surrender ourselves 
to him. Giving involves our money, but God also wants our very lives. And finally, and I love this one, giving is thanksgiving for the one who gave everything. Look again at verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. If we only had one verse in the entire Bible on giving, this would be the verse. And this is all the incentive we ever need. Paul shows us the example of Jesus, this ultimate generous giver. And just think, where would you be? Where would you be today if Christ hadn't died for you? Where would your soul be today? Where would your soul be all for all eternity if Christ hadn't generously given his life that you might live? Christ gave everything for us. And that's all the reason we need for each and every one of us to become generous givers. Every gift you give is, is really a, a gift of thanksgiving to God. Uh, there's one other passage I'd like us to look at today, and I turn just a page or two over to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. The Apostle Paul's still on the subject of giving, and beginning at verse 6 of chapter 9, he, he says this, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving toward God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing them uh, with everyone else. And in their prayers for you in their hearts, will, in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing uh, grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. So I want to take just a few moments and... and be very practical here and give some guidelines for giving generously. To look at what is this passage and a few other verses. What does the Bible teach? What does the New Testament teach about giving? How are we to give? God t tells us he loves a cheerful giver. So there are gifts that he loves and other gifts that if they don't come from this cheerful heart uh, that he uh, doesn't love. So we want to give gifts that God loves. So how are we to do that? Well, the first thing is God loves it when we give systematically. God loves it when we give systematically. Giving should be a, a regular, ongoing practice in our lives. In 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, Paul instructed, he said, Now about the collection for God's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. So Paul's saying, give on a, on a regular basis. Set aside money systematically. Make this a, a part of your life. Uh, giving's not to be a, a, like an every now and then event. And it's not to be guided primarily by our, our emotions. I mean, there may be times when our emotions are deeply affected by some need that we uh, see, some hurt that we see, and we may be moved to give more, more even more generously, uh, but if we waited for our emotions on all of our giving, how often would we really give to God? To do it systematically, uh, it's a lifestyle. Generous giving is a lifestyle. It's a regular part of our lives. Uh, second, the New Testament teaches we're to give proportionately. Again, Paul stated in 1 Corinthians 16, 2, each one of you should set aside a sum of money 
in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Uh, how much does Paul say we're to set aside? He says a sum of money, right? I mean, wouldn't it be better if he gave us a percent or amount, you know, just to do this? This is the minimum. No, he says, each one of you set aside a sum of money. And so I want to bring this next one up, too. We give proportionately and we give willingly. Back in 2 Corinthians 9, Paul says in verse 7, each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give. And earlier, chapter 8, said verse 12, for if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable. Now, this is, in some ways, this is a radical departure from the, the teaching of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the Jewish people were commanded by God to give a tithe. They were commanded to give a tenth of their income to, to God. The tithe was meant to be an offering to God. But for many, it had become more like a tax. And it was law. They had to give it. They were required to do it. And so I think for many, they viewed it more as not offering an a, a, a offering of worship to God, but they're paying their taxes. And what fun is that? Not, what joy is there in paying tax? That's what, for many, it had become. Interesting, when we get to the New Testament, this word tithe is not even used in the entire New Testament. Instead, we're, in a sense, told that giving is no matter a, 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 a matter of law. Giving now is a matter of love. And we're free to decide in our own hearts what we will give to God. We're not bound to that 10% in the Old Testament. Paul says we need to decide in our own hearts, our own minds, what, what we will give. That means we need to think about it and pray about it and really seek God. God, what, what do you want me to give? Here's my income. Here, Lord, then is what I think you want me to give. For some, you may decide, well, you know, it's not 10%. It's less than 10%. For others, maybe more than 10%. I mean, I've heard of people like, you give me give like 90%. So somewhere between 1 and uh, 100, I guess. You have to decide. What is God calling you to give? We're to give proportionately. We're to give willingly. And I love how he tells us we're, we're to give in a way that's not reluctant. Don't, you know, don't give reluctantly. Second Corinthians 9, 7, each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Don't let anyone ever talk you into giving or twist your arm into giving or put some guilt thing on you to get you to give. If you give out of guilt, compulsion, because somebody's twisted your arm, and God knows your heart's not in it, God doesn't want it. Uh, number five, uh, this is a tough one, but God loves gifts that are given sacrificially. Sacrificial gifts. Look again at what Paul said about the Macedonian church. He said, out of their most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Humanly, this makes no sense at all. Here, severe trial, severe poverty, and what does it cause? What springs up in these folks? <laughs> this, this rich generosity. Because even in their poverty, they could see the grace of God at work. They could see God's provision, God sustaining them, and they responded generously. I know we're going through difficult economic times as a, a country, and I know it affects all of us, and uh, some of us uh, especially hard. But I think it's fair to say that as Americans, we're still the, the most materially blessed and prosperous people on the entire planet. When we approach this idea of giving, we usually think about it in terms of giving out of our abundance. The people that Paul was writing to, they had no idea what abundance was. He's writing to people, talking to people that lived in extreme poverty. And yet we see their generosity through it. What means more to God? A gift that is given out of one's abundance or a gift that's given in the midst of poverty? Jesus answered that question when he commended the poor widow who laid two small coins on the altar, put two small coins in the temple treasury. When people all around here were bringing in huge amounts of money, and they're like the guy in the video, they're letting everybody see it. Jesus commended her, this 
this poor widow, so she gave more than all of them combined. It's two cents. It's two little coins. Couldn't have made a dent in the church's budget. Could have barely met anyone's need, I would think. Yet, Jesus said, because of her sacrifice, this little offering is absolutely enormous. It's not the amount that counts with God. It's the heart. It's the size of the sacrifice. David tells us he refused to give any offering to God that cost him nothing. All of our offerings should cost us something. And finally, I love this. God loves it when we give cheerfully. Give cheerfully. Again, verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 9, each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And the word cheerful, the Greek word for cheerful, is actually the word we get our English word hilarious from. So, like, we should roll on the floor laughing, apparently, when we give. We're so cheerful in giving. I think the cheer, when we pass the offering basket at church, that should be the most joyful part of our service because we're giving back to the God who's given so much to us. Now, I want to say a word, and this would be short and sweet. I want to say a word to those who aren't giving or who are under giving. You may know what God wants you to give, but you're not doing it. Well, I'm, I'm really grateful for this passage in many ways, but one reason is because I'm off the hook on this thing. I, it's not my place. I would be going against the apostles' teaching if I tried to make you feel guilty about that or twisted your arm or tried to compel you in any way. Uh, instead, let the word for you come from Paul, who said, just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, See that you also excel in this grace of giving. Giving is a grace, it's a privilege, and it's a very, very critical part of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. So if you're not giving, listen to Paul, listen to the Spirit, and do it. Let's move on. The last part of this message is about the blessings of generous giving. And I didn't even, if it was up to me, I wouldn't even talk about this. Because I always feel funny when we talk about giving, how things come around to how we will be blessed if we give. And sometimes I feel like it's a, uh, like we think of it like some kind of contract with God. You know, God, if I give 10%, you know, you're going to give me 15% back. Or I'll give you 20 and you'll give me 30. And kind of like that investment giver in the thing. Does God owe us any blessings from giving? Absolutely not. And yet he still blesses us. And Paul talks about those blessings. So let's look at the blessings of generous giving for uh, who are blessed. First, the giver becomes a receiver. The the giver becomes a receiver. Uh, Paul said, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. He says, You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. That's a bold promise. And it sounds like, you know, maybe that's true. You get put in 10%, you get 15 or whatever. It's, nah, it doesn't work that way. We don't deserve any blessing, but God gives us a blessing anyway. But it's not according to a formula. Remember, we're not giving to a bank. We're not giving to a, you know, a, a fund. We're giving to a living God. And he knows what we've given. And he decides how to bless us in in turn. God's not obligated to reimburse us. You think, I give to God, he's obligated to give me something back. No. In fact, I was thinking that, you know, if if we give it, let's say we give a sacrificial gift, but we give it expecting God to give us something back, then to me, that's not a sacrifice. It's a loan. You know, we've made a loan to God. A sacrifice is giving something to the Lord and not expecting anything in return. To me, that that qualifies as sacrifice. But God still blesses us. Uh, God has promised, you notice here, he doesn't talk about wants, but he's promised to meet all of our needs. Everything that we need, he'll make sure that we get. A great Bible teacher once said, God is willing to take full responsibility for the life that is totally surrendered to him. When you surrender yourself totally to God, And give everything you are to him. God will take full responsibility for the rest of your life. 
It's absolutely true. When you give God all that he really wants, which is really yourself, he'll make sure that you get, you have, whatever you need. One other thing here before we move on. Paul says that we'll have all that we need. We'll abound for every good work. We'll be made rich in every way so that we can be generous on every occasion. And I came across this uh, little illustration where someone was talking about when it comes to giving and then being blessed by God. He said, as believers, we need to be more like water reservoirs than, than dams. And he wanted to explain, uh, uh, the, a river feeds you know, uh, downward, and when it hits a dam, it dies. It stops right there. And he said, that's the way some believers are. They receive from God, and they just hold it. It's just theirs. It dyna, you know, it's for them. It dies right there. He said, no, God calls us to be reservoirs. And the blessing flows, and it fills this reservoir we have. And the whole purpose of a reservoir is to hold water temporarily to be distributed when it's needed, when someone else needs help. I like that. To be reservoirs, to take these blessings from God, to hold them and then be generous in, in dispersing them even farther. Uh, number, number two, uh, in terms of blessings, the recipients, those who receive uh, money, the help, their needs are met. Paul says the service you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing, I think that reservoir idea, in many expressions of thanks to God. Men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Jesus Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. When any believer gives to the local church, uh, well, I know when you give to FCCO, you not only support the ministry of FCCO and uh, help make it possible for the ministries of the church, but you're meeting spiritual needs of people. You have a part, all of it. We have a part of meeting spiritual needs of people in countries we'll never probably go to, people we'll probably never meet until heaven. Uh, there, there's some 2.8 billion or more people around the world who are living, it's estimated, who are living and dying without knowing Jesus Christ as their Savior. 2.8 or more billion people who don't have the hope of Christ. And some are right here in this community, and we're doing some things to reach them. We're taking this Celebrate Recovery ministry, this uh, ministry to bring people real hope in the uh, midst of slavery to addiction. Um, our our you know, children's ministry, youth ministry, dinner bell, other outreach ministries. Uh, we're doing what Paul talks about. We we are confessing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they all take money. Uh, and then there's that participation of proclaiming the gospel overseas, like the blisses in South Africa, Haiti, on and on. It's an amazing thing. I don't think we understand just how far our money goes in, in building the kingdom of God and winning people to Jesus Christ. So recipients' needs are met. Another blessing, and this is pretty much all we need, is that God is praised. God is praised when we give generously. Your generosity, he says, will result in thanksgiving to God. This service you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. To me, this is the heart of giving. When we give, we praise our God. We praise him as our provider and sustainer. And notice Paul says that this giving is a service. It's an act of service. It's an act of service. It's this, this gift that we give to God and his people. We glorify him, praise him in our giving. And then finally, and this is a little surprising. I hadn't seen this before, but uh, the final blessing is that the church is united. The church is united. And Paul says in their gr uh, prayers for you, in their hearts, for, and I always have trouble with this, and in their prayers for you, in their hearts, in their prayers, you know what he's saying here, right? Um, their hearts go out to these believers because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. This is very significant. Uh, the churches, 
Paul's talking about here, basically three churches. You have the Macedonian churches, you have the Corinthian church, and then you have these believers that are in Jerusalem. Those are ones that are in, you know, the beyond poverty are the ones that are in Jerusalem. I would say that the Macedonian churches had, had never met these people in Jerusalem. Jerusalem people had never met Corinthians, vice versa, all the way around. And yet, they come together in this act of giving. God uses this act of giving to bring unity to the church. And, and there were some issues. There were some problems. There, there were some difficulties between these churches. But they came together for a common purpose, to glorify God in caring for their hurting brothers and sisters, and it united the church. Uh, giving does that, and it even does that here in our day, here at FCCO. When we give, when we all are a part of carrying out the mission of the church, it unifies us. It unifies us around our focus on following Jesus, loving one another, and then sharing the Holy Spirit, saving and healing power with our neighbors right here and then around the world. And we do it all because of what Christ has done for us. We're generous with others because Christ has been so generous with us. And as Paul says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we're going to take an offering now. And Lord, we want this to be cheerful. And even at it, the it, it, very least in our hearts, you know, just to be hilarious. We're just so, so thankful. We're so grateful for all that you've done for us that we can't wait now to give back. It's, I mean, it's a portion to you. And Lord, we pray that these gifts would be acceptable to you, each and every one. And that you will bless this money and help us as church leaders to do what you want done with it. To put it to work in our church, in our community, and then around this world that you love so much. Lord, thank you for this privilege now we have of giving to you. And we do, Lord, praise you and thank you for your great gift to us on the cross. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.